Have a feast by a tree. That's, that's all she said to me. It's been about three years since I had this surreal and definitely disturbing encounter with this stranger, but I've often revisited what she said to me several times since. This morning, in our study of Ephesians, we are talking about reconciliation, and it is a theme that I am very passionate about. Okay. Reconciliation is a word that's been in the news a lot these past several years as survivors of residential schools have come forward and as we continue to discuss issues of ongoing injustice. So when I hear the word reconciliation, my mind immediately goes to that and maybe it's the same for you. That will play in to our message today, but first I want to zoom in or rather zoom out and acknowledge that in the Christian story, reconciliation is what the entire story is all about. The definition of reconciliation is the restoration of friendly relations. The beginning of the story, God creates humanity to have this relationship with. God himself is inherently a relationship. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he created us for relationship. The Bible says that Adam and Eve had a walking and talking relationship with God. How cool would that be to be able to, in person, walk and talk with God? Is there a crackle Procedure? <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Are you working on it? Okay, let me know how I can help because that's really annoying. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Adam and Eve have this walking and talking friendship with God. And as you know how the story goes, in the middle of the garden is a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were given this one command to not eat its fruit. What do they do? eat the fruit. <laughs> they eat the fruit. We would be in a very different place this morning had they not eaten the fruit, but they ate that fruit, and it brings us here today. In that moment, they disobeyed God. Their relationship with this perfect and holy God was severed, but in that exact same instant, thank you, but in that exact same instant, their relationship with each other was severed. Listen to how their language, their communication instantly changed. It changed to one of blame. That woman you gave me told me to eat the fruit. It's her fault. And their experience of each other in their relationship turned to one of shame. <gasps> put, put, put some clothes on. Grab a leaf, do something. They, they felt shame for the first time. They were communicating with language like blame for the first time. Their relationship was severed. And from there, it just seemed to get compounded through the generations. Their children, Cain and Abel, provide us with the first example of sibling rivalry, which morphed into murder, which morphed into exile, which morphed into there being different nations, which morphed into war, and on and on until today, the divisions have only multiplied. If the story of Adam and Eve depicts the breakup, then the rest of the story until this present day has been all about the makeup. God's actions and desire to restore his friendship with us, his intended intimacy with us. I find it interesting that on this along this timeline of reconciliation, God himself creates a division. It was when 
he chose to set apart a people for his very own, the Israelites, the Jews. He said to Abram, Abram, I am going to make you into a great nation, and your people and your descendants are going to be a light to, to the world, and through you, the Savior of the world will come. He set the Israelites apart. I find it intriguing that God created a division in order to repair a division. And for the Israelites to illustrate this for us, for the Israelites to illustrate for us what it meant to live in right relationship with God, they needed some help. God gave them a lot of rules and regulations involving regular sacrifices, and they had to demonstrate through their lives that they were different than the cultures and communities around them who were doing some pretty horrible things by this point in history. The Israelites were not allowed to um, worship the gods of other nations. They were not even allowed to intermarry with other cultures. They were to be completely set apart. And even the blueprint of the temple that they had been given had a series of courts. And the outermost court was called the court of the Gentiles because that is the only court where non-Jews were able to gather. There was only two groups of people in the world at this point, the Jews and everybody else who were called the Gentiles. It was, so, it was such a serious offense if a Gentile ever crossed over the barrier from the outer court into the inner courts because it would desecrate the inner courts because they weren't the people set apart to enter God's presence in that way. In fact, it was taken so seriously that a death penalty was assigned to anyone who crossed that barrier. They posted a plaque at, the, at that barrier in Latin and in Greek, carved there, and essentially what it says is, he who trespasses will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. Whoa. And I had read that even if that person was a Roman citizen, the Romans had given permission for the Jewish people to take him out for desecrating their temple. Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. <clears throat> However, even though this division and separation had been the case for hundreds of years, at the time God chose, Jesus enters the scene. He was born a Jew. He grew up to become a rabbi. And scripture tells of him sacrificing himself on the cross to pay for the sins of everybody, both the Jews and the Gentiles. And today's passage in Ephesians sums this up in a powerful way. It is found in chapter 2, starting at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and to those who were near, for through him, we both have access to the Father through one Spirit. Amen. Through his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus not only dismantled the barrier between us and God, but he also destroyed 
the dividing walls between us and each other. When you look at history, you see how we have become specialists in creating divisions. Um, right now at the Human Rights Museum, they have the Nelson Mandela exhibit where you can go and see firsthand how highly developed and evil the system of apartheid was. You think in World War II under Hitler, he organized thousands of people under him to see to it that systematically the Jews would be divided from the non-Jews. And both apartheid and the Holocaust, they share the same root, the same evil root as Canada's own residential schools. Except in this case, we took it a step further. We didn't just divide, we attempted to conform. And in the scripture today, it says that Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. And that is not about conformity. It has nothing to do with conformity, but everything to do with unity. Unity and conformity are not the same thing. God created diversity. But think of the diversity in creation. That glorifies him. And it's the extent to which that we in our diversity are unified that God is glorified. Around his throne in heaven, God describes people of every tribe, tongue, language, nation. He wouldn't say that there's going to be different tribes and tongues and languages and nations if it was his intention for us to make each other all the same. He wants to be glorified by the beating of the indigenous drum. He wants to be glorified by the dancing of the African people. He wants to be glorified by everything that we have to bring to him around his throne, being fully who he's created us to be. Anything that divides us along cultural or racial lines is not of God. Martin Luther King Jr. got this and dedicated his life to seeing that the system of segregation of black people and white people in southern U.S. was dismantled. Listen to this quote. He said, The cross is the eternal expression of the length to which God will go to restore broken community. The resurrection is a symbol of God's triumph over the forces that seek to block community. The Holy Spirit is the continuing community creating reality that moves through history. He who works against community is working against the whole of creation. And this applies to our church as well. There's a theologian, he's a recently retired Anglican bishop. His name is, he goes by N.T. Wright. And he said this, if our churches are still divided in any way along racial or cultural lines, then our very grasp of the meaning of Jesus' death is called into question. Now, I've noticed how the meeting place has increased in its cultural diversity over the last few years, and that makes me really excited because as a, as a group, as a family, we're starting to look a lot more like heaven. And the cross that unites us is good news for everyone, for Jew and Gentile, for black and white, for male and female, and for the First Nations and everyone who joined them here. And that particular relationship is one that's close to my heart uh, because several years ago, my mom and dad in Kenora, who are here this morning, oh my heart, who are here this morning, um, they became foster parents. 
And it was through, oh, it was through the experience of one little girl that they had been given from birth and, and who has come and gone from their home since that God really got our attention. She has known tremendous heartache. And just knowing that her experience is multiplied across our nation is almost, is almost too much to bear. So God got our attention. And I had previously worked with many little girls like her, uh, indigenous girls, at a summer camp where I had volunteered for several years. So, starting the story, I direct a program, a drop-in mom and kids program for new immigrant women to learn English. And while their kids play, we just have English conversation and do some activities together. So several years ago, just a few years ago actually, when we were invited to open a second location in the North End, I got really excited. But it was important to me if we opened a second location in the North End, we would no longer be about just a drop-in for new immigrant moms, but rather we would be about building bridges between the newcomers and their indigenous neighbors. The year we started this second location was 2014, and that was the year that Winnipeg received the highest number of refugees per capita in Canada. So the demographic of the North End was changing pretty quickly. And um, new immigrants and indigenous people were living next door to each other, but they didn't necessarily get each other. And, uh, and that's a shame, because I believe they have a lot of shared experience, but just not the shared history. Um, we wanted to bring these groups together and have a play group where these neighbors could get to know each other and hear each other's stories and appreciate each other and their shared values for their children and for their community. So we applied and received full funding from the Manitoba Arts Council to do a collaborative art project to bring these groups together. And uh, it was to be called First Nations, All Nations, Setting the Table. The idea being how we set the table today as adults, as parents, as community members, will determine the atmosphere around the table when our kids sit down to join us. If we do the hard work today of leaning into relationship with one another, our kids won't miss a beat, and they'll pick up on that unity and carry it on. I had in my mind that it would be neat to kick off this project with a community feast a Thanksgiving feast, a potluck that we would have at the Forks uh, just to bring the community together and have a chance to tell them about this project. Well, it wasn't long before this kickoff that I had that deeply troubling encounter with an Indigenous woman who I had never met before. It was outside on a warm autumn evening downtown with a ministry called Loves Lives Here, which is kind of, it's a trailer in a vacant lot that serves kind of like a church for people who live on the street. And I was walking around handing out beverages and I saw a group of indigenous young people sitting on the ground and I just felt that it would be okay to just sit down and just be, and just be present. And uh, it wasn't completely in my comfort zone, especially considering that all or some of them were under the influence of some kind of chemical. But I sat down and we just started to talk. And the conversation was actually going pretty well. It was feeling natural and I was getting excited and like, ah, they're accepting me and we're just talking like normal people. And so I tried to make another connecting point. So I asked, so, did anyone go to camp when they were a child? And the woman sitting across from me said, yes, I hated it. And I said, well, well, why? And she said, they're all abusers. And I, I felt sick. But I didn't realize what I had just done, but it had unleashed a torrent inside of her of hate and anger and pain, and for that 
next several moments, I just sat there and received in full force, absorbing in full force all that she had to say to me who was in that moment representative of every white person who had ever lived. Her words were cutting. She said, you rape our babies. You rape our children. You rape our land. And by this point, I was, I was standing and I had tears in my eyes. And I, all I could say was, but, but, but I wasn't born yet. But I wasn't there. And she kept going on and on. And I was like, so, so what do we do? What do we do? Because in that moment, my mind went to my parents' little foster girl and her own generational trauma that she's experiencing in that cycle. And then I see this woman across from me. And I thought of all that God had already been preparing my heart for for this moment. And I was like, God, what do we do? And I ask you now, God, God, what do we do? And... <sighs> And then I guess it threw them off that I was emotional as white girls crying. And they, she softens. And then it was surreal. She takes my hand, takes it into her hand, and she looks at me with these glazed eyes, and she says, my grandfather forgives you, and I forgive you. And yet, I wasn't feeling it. I was wondering, does she, is she just saying that because that's what she's supposed to say? I just, I wasn't feeling it. So I asked her again, so what do we do? And she said, she looked at me, she paused, and she said, have a feast by a tree. And I said, okay. And it wasn't long after that, just a few weeks, that I'm like, okay, we definitely have to make this happen now. And in very short succession, the things came together. I called up my small group and like, guys, I need your help. I need volunteers. We're going to have this potluck at the Forks. The Forks ended up giving us their space in front of the Scotiabank stage for free. We just didn't have enough chairs. So I was like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Pulled the car up in front of the meeting place, went in. I <laughs> talked to Pastor Kevin. I go, Pastor Kevin, God is going to do something do you want in? Because here's your opportunity. We need a whole bunch of chairs. <laughs> and I go, and a sound system would be nice. They don't do that. Don't go and ask them for that because that doesn't, it's not done. But in that moment, they did want to participate in what God was about to do. And they said yes. And the day arrived. The day of the feast arrived. It was a beautiful, sunny day in October. The food was delicious. And the beautiful children that were tearing around reminded us what unity could look like. And as I saw the kids running around in those trees, I remember they were playing tag, running in and out through the trees. I remember looking at the trees and thinking, which one, which one is the tree that we were supposed to have the feast around? Well, None of the trees stood out to me. But several months later, when our collaborative art project ended, a tree did appear. For six weeks, we had met once a week about, um, there had been about 15 to 25 indigenous and new immigrant women that met each week. We would eat each other's food, um, learn a bit, a few words from each other's language. We talked about our childhoods. We talked about what we learned from the people who raised us. We talked about what we want most for our own children and for our own community and futures. And the, this professional printmaking artist, Karen Cornelius, there with the red hair, she listened to our stories and took sketches, and she took the women's sketches that they had drawn of themselves and she had integrated it into this beautiful emblem. And this is the moment when she had just revealed the emblem. And it was actually met with quite a bit of emotion. Um, we're still unpacking all that the emblem means, but I'm going to show it to you and explain to you uh, a bit of what we've come up with. So to start, you notice on the far left, there's leaves that look like palm branches. And those leaves stand for some people might have come from a country with leaves like that. But then they find themselves in a country of four seasons. So we've got 
summer, fall, winter, spring. And they may go through a winter experience where you feel like everything's lost, but there are always new beginnings. And we've got the budding leaves on the far right here. And the, those leaves, those new beginnings, that's what we want to focus on. But then there's the roots. And the roots remind us that our roots are so important. Whether we've been uprooted from our land. Where's this little camel there? Whether we've been uprooted from our land or whether we've been uprooted from our culture, it's so important that we let our roots go down together again into good soil and move forward as one nation. Now, if you'll notice something I didn't point out, the, feather, the, the branch that's closest to the tree of leaves, it looks like a feather. And that feather, up, up one, up another, that one looks like a feather. And that's representative of the first peoples who are closest to the tree. And this reminds us that we need to keep looking to the foundations of Canada even as we continue to build on it. As new people continue to arrive, you gotta look, how's the foundation doing? Is it sound, is it whole? It was fractured when we started building on it. I think it needs some re-engineering as we continue to build. Hmm. What time is it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Just show you the picture. We printed those, we printed that symbol onto tablecloths for each woman's home. And each woman could set her table with the same desires for her family. Do you have that photo there? And we've also started, that's the tablecloth, and we've also started sewing them into bags uh, to get the message further out into the community. <laughs> but this is not the tree God wants us to gather around. What tree does he want us to gather around? That one. If you even look at the shape of it, I love how the tree captures the vertical and the horizontal. Our vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with each other. Where those two planes intersect is exactly, is probably where Jesus' heart would have been. And that's where his heart still is today. And in closing, I want to remind us of one more tree. It's the tree described in the book of Revelations when we're all together in heaven, the tree of life. And it also describes a feast, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, when all nations, tribes, and tongues gather, when reconciliation is finally complete. But God wants to start and continue and perpetuate that reconciliation through us, even today, as ambassadors of reconciliation. And we're going to have the opportunity this morning to hear from some individuals in our community who are doing that in special ways. And they'll extend an invitation to you to participate in the awesome work of reconciliation, of God drawing us to himself and using us to draw others to himself and to each other. Let's worship. Okay, so our first question, this is a bit of a, Bit of a tough one, but I'll give it to you here. And the person puts it like this. They say, so it's one thing to know that reconciliation embraces and celebrates diversity. I love that, but I live in a mostly white world every day. How do I work towards reconciliation between indigenous people and settler people in the life I live? Hmm. I wonder, is that person an indigenous person? I can't tell you. <laughs> Plus, I don't know. It's a number, right? Like, I mean, it doesn't come with a, uh, a descriptor on their life here. 
Well, it's interesting because I come up against this a lot as a, as a white, privileged, middle class person who, where, where do you have the right to speak into or on behalf of other people whose experience you have not had, like that of the refugee or an indigenous person. And then I was starting to feel almost ashamed of my like whiteness, like just stay quiet. Um, but I realized whoever you are, whatever race and national you are, God's, first of all, he made it that way. It's for a divine purpose. And you have unique access to a sphere of people around you. So who is that sphere of people? Those are the people you communicate to. So if I am who I am, well, maybe the audience that I can speak to most directly and most confidently are other white, privileged, middle-class people who maybe need to hear um, some of the stories that have, have you know, come my way, for example. So for that person, just to in, encourage them to... Uh, I don't know if the approach is any different, whether you're coming from the majority or from minority, but I can't speak for that person because I'm not. Mm -hmm. But the more we train our minds to see each individual as a child of God who God intentionally made that way um, and look for God in that person and how he wants to reveal himself to you through that person, I think it tethers us uh, to others when you just, in your every interaction, look for God in that person. Okay, next question. Did you ever see that girl again? The one who told you to eat under the tree. And maybe what I'll do is I'll pass you my mic because we're having that crackle issue again. That crackle issue. Um, no. No. And yet... Our encounter was so brief, and it was three years ago, that I wonder if I would um, see her, if our paths uh, crossed, or maybe I've cro passed, cross, crossed paths in the street. But that's an easy answer. I haven't seen her, but I've thought about her a lot. And I must pray for her as this theme continues in my mind. Okay, next question. Thanks, Laurel. These are powerful truths. In your tree tr emblem that you shared, what was the meaning of the river line in the trunk? Oh, my. <laughs> Friends, you have given me another revelation because that was never a river. That was a path. That was a path because an indigenous woman had shared one of her strongest childhood memories was walking up the path to her cookum's house to have a feast. And that had characterized her childhood. So the artist integrated that. But a river. Oh my. Because the scriptures say, oh, the scriptures say in Ezekiel that there's this this river with this tree and the healing of the nations is in its leaves. That's holy. And in, the same pa in, in a similar passage in Revelations where it talks about the tree of life, it talks about a river, crystal, a crystal river flowing. Um, and the tree is on either side of the river. So it's interesting because I'm like one tree on either side of the river. So it's almost like you see the river going through the tree, it's like you're passing through the tree. So from now on, this has become a river. <laughs> and we live in the heart of Turtle Island, in the heart of the continent, where two rivers meet. And for such a time as this, if God's heart is for reconciliation, may it start in our city here. And may it spread to the nations. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God's word is, is living and active. This, you, nice, nice bag, Lisa. <laughs> She's got it. Anyways, um, that is holy. The, the feast, the tree, the river. We've got all the elements here in the city. And summertime is often characterized 
by coming together and feasting. We call it a barbecue, but it's a feast. It's our culture, our cultures, our collective cultures. Feast is having a barbecue, bringing people together, breaking bread. That's a holy moment. That's a moment that if we have our feast around this tree, God can bring restored relationships. May we come with a posture and that prayer for restored relationships as we have a barbecue with um, loved ones. But this challenge I'd like to issue to you is this. We're all about reordering our lives for the compassionate cause of Christ. I challenge us as a body to think of a feast we can have with someone outside of our immediate circle of friends and, and therefore be participant in the work of reconciliation that God is doing. If you need help with that, this is powerful. Our church has been entrusted with the names of three families, three Yazidi families, the Yazidi people um, who have escaped from ISIS. They were captive by ISIS. Most of the men were killed and the women were taken as slaves, women and children. Canada sponsored a bunch of them, and they've, the bulk of them have arrived in two cities, and Winnipeg is one of them. And my friend, who's on the board of our organization, she's a sewing instructor with us, she works with Operation Ezra, which is actually a Jewish organization. She's my Jewish sister. And these Yazidi people are so isolated, and they're living among us. The trauma that they have gone through is unfathomable and they need relationship. And my Jewish friend with Operation Ezra says, Laurel, can you help? And I said, well, I know some people. I took it to my church and I thought, what if with our small groups, if we each had even just three small groups, each to say, you know what, we meet we do some special activities during the year. Maybe there's a family that we could say, hey, we're having a barbecue. Just come. It doesn't have to be more than that. Just to invite them to break bread together, that's an opportunity. There are some physical needs that haven't been met, like, like they might need a sofa or a bicycle or things that we all might have kicking around. But a used sofa is far easier to come by than a relationship. But remember, that's where the heart of Jesus is. So I'm just saying, um, there's only three, but we can get more. They know of 48 families that have contacted them. And uh, trust is a big deal because they don't know who to trust. And I just think it's precious that the body of Christ had been approached to offer that because we're ambassadors of reconciliation. And uh, here's an opportunity to, to love them concretely. Pastor Paul has the information. You can email him. And uh, he'll probably put you in touch with me and just, just pray about that because I've been challenged by these families. Most of them are widows and uh, their children because the men um, have been killed. So we know that's close to God's heart, is caring, caring for those women. This is my closing. Um, may God... Be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his ways would be known through the earth and his salvation to all nations. Let's go in the peace and love of Christ and of each other. Amen. Amen.